Hello, it's Marty Lee here and welcome to the Renewy Living Podcast. This is a show that helps you live sustainably. All it takes is a reduce and reuse and start where you live approach. Based in Newcastle, Australia, each conversation will be with changemakers in my community who are doing good for people and planet. You'll discover how community, culture and our natural environment intertwine to create a positive environmental impact. Together, we'll learn how to naturally embed sustainability into our unique lifestyles. So join me on the Renewy Living Podcast. Community gardens are green spaces that serve a purpose beyond simply growing fresh food. They're about cultivating connections and are a rich solution to tackling big issues. Today we're joined by Adrian Garner from Smokva Community Garden in Wickham. Adrian shares his local knowledge and experience on how community gardens are more than just a space for plants. Hello and welcome, Adrian. Hello, thank you so much for having me. How is a community garden different from backyard gardening? A community garden is pretty similar in a lot of ways to backyard gardening, except perhaps it's a bit bigger and you're not there by yourself. There are often a crowd of people helping out with gardening, which is a benefit, I imagine. And anyone's free to walk through at any time as well. I have lots of experience gardening in people's backyards and it's actually frustrating sometimes when you've been working for many, many years on a garden and it's looking beautiful and the best you can do to share it with someone is take a photo of it. And the photos don't really do a living, changing space very much justice. Can you give us an image of what your community garden looks like in your suburb. It's hidden behind a bocce field at a bowling club. You might miss it if you didn't know that it was there, but if you were exploring the grounds of the bowling club, you might walk around the bocce field and notice a gateway of banner grass, which is, it almost looks like bamboo, but it's tall grass that forms a bit of a wall. And then uh, as you walk through, there's a winding path that goes through annual garden beds dotted with some larger trees and bananas. And often the trees are backlit by the sun, which is shining onto the garden. And so it's pretty magical. And most people kind of make a comment to that effect when they're coming through it. And people find it hard to put their finger on what's special about the community garden, but everyone kind of agrees that it's a nice place to be. It does sound like a really relaxing place, particularly that meandering aspect Often in a built environment, we've got hard surfaces, very straight angles. So your garden sounds very soft. It is, yeah. We have decided not to have raised garden beds because the drainage is a lot more effective in a raised garden bed and you have the sun beating down on it. So often raised garden beds are very crisp and the plants in them are struggling. I didn't even realise that. Yeah, so we've chosen to put all our crops straight in the ground. It does pose a bit of a problem for people that have trouble bending down, but we have some raised wicking beds too. What's a wicking bed? A wicking bed is like a self-watering flower pot. Do you know those? Mm -hmm. A pot with a little reservoir of water in the bottom. And the plants aren't sitting in the water. Often they have just a few spots where the root can dip down and touch the water so they don't get inundated with water but also they never dry out as long as there's water in the reservoir at the bottom and wicking beds are a large scale version of that so they can catch water and store it for a while and then slowly feed it to the plants from below so there's less loss due to evaporation of the sun hitting the surface. I see lots of community gardens dotted around the suburbs And one thing I do when I walk past or drive past is I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to go in there or not. That's interesting to hear because I didn't know that people feel that way. And there's probably things that we can do to take away that discomfort. Yeah. So what could you do? Yeah, signage. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a sign that says everyone's welcome to eat something and everyone is welcome to participate. I love it. That does sound like if I walked past your garden... I would feel more comfortable in knowing that that is a place for me. So if I'm not actually involved in the gardening 
part of things. Am I able to take the produce that you're growing? Some community gardens have some pretty specific rules about that. We're a little bit more easygoing. People get to decide whether they're entitled to produce or not, I guess. And I think most people decide that they are. There's kind of a inference in having things growing out in the open that they're fair game for people to take. We do have some signs that suggest how much would be reasonable to take. For example, taking a few vegetables off a plant is better etiquette than taking the whole plant. Oh, wow. People take the whole plant? Yeah. Some people are surprisingly clueless when it comes to sharing spaces and produce. Hopefully, people who come to your garden, that that's a part of what you're trying to achieve is the education about gardening and growing. Yeah, absolutely. When you participate in a community garden, you become aware that you are going to be exposed to some disappointing behaviours, but you're also given some opportunities to have some constructive conversations with people. So many times someone might be able to come and pull out a plant or a whole crop of plants while no one's there. But there are times when I walk up on someone that is in the process of taking up a whole crop of plants and then we're able to have a conversation about it. And there doesn't need to be much of a conversation, actually. I think sometimes just the act of having someone else see your actions is enough to make you reflect again on whether you're doing the right thing. Yeah, most definitely. And that enables that community connection. Your garden is very strongly embedded in permaculture principles. And one of the principles is about fair share. So this is where you were starting to talk about, you know, what is fair and just for not just you, but for everybody. Yeah, that's right. If I see someone harvesting someone, then I can ask them if they're interested in helping out. And if the answer is no, then it becomes pretty obvious that taking from the garden when you're not prepared to give to the garden is not necessarily the right thing to do. What some of the successes that you've seen in the community garden since you've been involved with it? I consider the fact that there's a fairly big group of people that enjoy coming back on a weekly basis pretty reliably as being a big success. And the fact that we've formed friendships to the point where if someone doesn't turn up, there'll be several people that get in touch with that person to find out if they're okay and what they're doing. Yeah, that's amazing. Couldn't ask for anything more than that. I think anything else that comes out of the garden is a bonus. Yeah, so gardening is first and foremost, but it's all the flow-on effects that come from that gardening. Well, I would say the garden is the reason that people are coming together, but it's almost like the coming together ends up being a more valuable thing than the gardening in the end. Or maybe, you know, the two are inseparable. Gardening is also a great way to have very tangible activities to help mitigate climate change. True. The value I see, I think, comes from being able to spend your time somewhere locally and improve your own environment. So that might not be obvious at first, but if you think about gardening and the kind of activities that it might be displacing, then I think you see the benefits. So if you're coming together to grow food, we also need to think about the fact that the food that you're taking back from the community garden is offsetting food that you might have otherwise bought from the supermarket. And if you're buying food from the supermarket, you had to drive to the supermarket, but also a truck had to drive the food to the supermarket and tractors needed to plough the field that the food was growing in. Instead of gardening, I might have decided to drive to the cinema and watch a movie. And then we need to think about that trip and the air conditioning and the production of the movie. There's a lot of benefit from keeping things simple and local and spending time, yeah, just improving our direct environment. Yeah. So you're improving your local environment, your local suburb, you're connecting with local people. You have regular catch-ups for gardening. What kind of things do you do? Every week we make compost. So we collect food scraps from a local cafe. We bring it down to the garden and... We have a paid position for someone just so that we know that that's going to happen every week. So every week that person layers the food scraps and makes compost. And as a byproduct of that, every week we get fresh compost from several weeks prior that's ready to use. So we're pulling out weeds as they come up. 
and improving our garden beds and planting seeds or seedlings. And we grow our own mulch there. So we're cutting down this banner grass that I mentioned and then chopping it up into mulch and using that to mulch the beds. And then there's other side projects going on as well, like at various stages we've had chickens. So there's work to do maintaining the chicken pens and there's work to do maintaining the worms. So we have a volunteer that is very dedicated to feeding and checking on the worms. And so everyone that comes kind of finds their niche, whether it be watering or planting seeds or tidying or raking. Do you have someone who just comes and is the cup of tea person? Yes. People often come and they apologize when they haven't done any work, but I try and reassure them that that is one of the jobs is just to have a chat. And there's a lot of that that happens. Yeah. We meet for two hours and half an hour is us drinking tea and coffee and having a chat. So, yeah. Um, it's a big part of it. When you were saying about the compost earlier and you're getting your compost and your food scraps from local cafes, how good is that? That's like connecting the community with cafes who are also trying to do good for our planet. It's crazy that commercial composting, I think it's a service that businesses can apply for, but it's crazy that we don't have compost collection on a council level. So it's nice to be able to provide that. People also bring their own compost into the community garden. Oh, good. Because in your council area, there's not the food organics, garden organics bins as yet. There isn't, no. I know in surrounding council areas there is. So your community garden is a great help and source for people to know what to do with their food scraps, are having trouble trying to compost at home, and then can bring it into the garden to know that they're doing a better thing and can contribute and help out. Yeah, it is. It's great that it brings people to the garden. I wouldn't say that we could process all the compost in Newcastle, but for the people that are really keen about it and keen to to come for a walk, it's a nice, um, because the compost builds up on a weekly basis, it provides this nice rhythm for people that come and visit the garden regularly. And similarly for us, that stream of compost that comes into the garden is a good rhythm to keep us revitalising our garden beds. Rhythms are so important to life. They're important with nature. Your philosophy comes down to permaculture. Permaculture is all about rhythm as well. It's a slow rhythm. It's a much slower rhythm perhaps than what we're used to in society. How do you help keep us slow? I don't think I need any help um, slowing things down. (laughs) And I think in community organisations where people aren't getting paid to turn up every week, things go naturally pretty slow. And I think for most people getting involved in a community garden, that's probably a bit of an adjustment process is getting used to the fact that things do take a lot of time and that we see slow progress. But slow is good. Slow is good. Slow enables you to stop and to watch and to understand. You can help out your community members be slow in the garden tend to the garden, but there's also tangible things that you provide, such as bakashi bins. Yeah, that's a good example of slow being an engaging thing because people have some bad experiences with compost. They might have grown up with a bin in their backyard that never got tended to, and you just keep adding stuff to it, and it just keeps dissolving into the ground or into the mouths of cockroaches that disperse into the neighbourhood. But I find... People's interest can be awakened if they look into it deeper rather than trying to find an easy solution. So in our case, when we collect the compost, we actually pre-ferment it with bakashi. And rather than buying the bakashi, we actually make the bakashi from scratch. That's a good thing. That is definitely all about slow. Yeah, and it's interesting as well. It's not much of a story to say, I went to the shops and I bought some bakashi and I squirted in the bucket and that's it. But to talk about catching the bacteria out of the air and breeding it up and then soaking it in newspaper and, yeah, it kind of invites more questions. And if people want to understand how that works, it's a, it's a whole conversation. And it's interesting that people might be more engaged with something that is a little bit more complicated than something that is kind of simple and fast. I'm one of those people with the compost. Which one? The compost. I I have tried. It's either slimy or it's too dry and there's lots of rats around. Yeah. But in our particular house, the rats 
encourage the diamond python. So it ended up to be quite circular. Well, that's pretty cool. It's very cool. But I didn't end up having compost. So coming to your garden and learning about that would be brilliant. What are other tips about growing vegetables that people learn when they come to your garden? First of all, I think I need to say I need to come to your house and learn how to (laughs) attract diamond pythons because I'd love to have a diamond python. We've got the advantage that we back onto a bush and we've had diamond pythons for a few years and we didn't realise that every time my husband cleaned out the roof gutters, there would be a skin, a snake skin in the gutter. So, and then this, the diamond python got big enough that it lived on the roof. It would come out and sun itself and live on the roof of the house. Um, but you are more than welcome to come and see our, re- <laughs> our natural reptiles in the habitat. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So what other tips have you got for people to help grow their vegetables through the seasons? My tip is experimentation. And I think that's something that you can get from visiting the community garden and having a go. I don't think anyone can get around the rite of passage that is making a garden and having it fail for whatever reason, because that's how you learn how to garden. Someone can come to the community garden and they can have a go at planting vegetables in the shade and seeing how well they do. Or they can have a go at planting it in a patch of grass and see how your vegetables go competing with grass. Vegetables in grass, can they work together? Well, I mean, people try it all the time. People try growing vegetables right next to weeds and it doesn't make for a great result. And I suppose coming to the garden, you'll also find out what's good for your area. Yeah, by having conversations with people. Well, it happens quite naturally. If something grows well, then there's an abundance of it, which means there's seeds to share. You get that information in the form of here are the seeds from the beans that took over my garden last year. Why are you passionate about community gardens? It was that thing of gardening behind closed fences and putting all this effort into beautiful spaces that only benefit a few people. So community gardens allows you or it allows me to put effort into something that then is enjoyed by a lot of people. And then other people can also put effort in and then we get to enjoy the fruits of each other's labor. So experimenting with being a bit more communal about our lives. So How did you get into the Smokva community garden? I've always been drawn to community gardens, so I've been involved with community gardens wherever I've been. Smokva in particular, I happened to be talking to someone that lived very close to that garden who was involved in it in the past. It's gone through a lot of phases in life, so it started in Morrow Park, I think 20 years ago or so, the bowling club there. And then it moved to the Croatian club. And I think it's been there for 15 years. And the last five of those years, it was pretty fallow. And a friend was talking about the garden and said, we just need someone to coordinate it and it would be great. And I said, that's something I'd love to do. So that's how I got involved with it. And I have to say, I'm not the kind of person that would push myself into that position. I'm kind of shy and would hang back and wait for the invitation. So having been given the invitation... I've very enthusiastically stepped up to be involved and boss people around. Oh, yeah, all systems go for that. But I think it also sounds like your passion and your starting point was about gardening in general and you felt confident about the gardening and therefore because you had all this knowledge, you just were happy to share and be a part of that. Yeah, I guess people need permission to experiment and being in a position to be paid for gardening and sometimes paid to experiment with gardening. That kind of gives me the confidence to be able to help other people have a go at that. Gardens are great for that social connection and well-being. What if you would love to be a part of the garden, but you just don't have the time to help out in the garden? At the simplest level, you can enjoy your garden by visiting it. It's a perfect green space, isn't it? Yeah, anyone that doesn't have time to garden in a community garden might have time to take their lunch and go and eat it in a community garden. So do that. What are some of the challenges of having a community garden? Oh, being in an open space presents a lot of challenges. Often we will turn up and either people will have literally dumped hard rubbish into the community garden, which is a little bit hard to wrap your head around. Other times people will kind of dump the kind of things that you would expect to go to an op shop in the community garden. So kitchen appliances and picture frames and lamps. And it's just the whole spectrum of appropriateness 
things that would be appropriate to bring to a community garden are maybe seeds or seedlings and an appropriate time to bring them would be when there's people there. I think when people need to drop things off in the cover of darkness, they need to ask themselves whether it's actually an appropriate donation. But we see everything. They're massive challenges yeah. um, and something that you didn't think that you actually needed. <laughs> no, it'd be quite depressing and but also provides a bit of insight into people's yeah. psyche as well, like um, how short of time must people be that they decide that it's a good idea to take a mattress to a community garden. If you're interested in establishing a community garden in your area, what are those things that you need to be mindful about? Well, there's a few things that would help to be mindful of, and that is the scale of the commitment. Because I think with any community project, sometimes, and especially in the beginning, they need drivers. And I have seen situations where people have decided to start a community garden, but they haven't envisioned themselves as being the person that is going to continue gardening there. So I don't think it's right to design or start a community garden with the benefit of someone else in mind. You really need to be doing it for yourself and imagine yourself providing that work as opposed to the community, whoever that might be. And if you're willing to do that, then I think you can expect that your enthusiasm will be infectious and other people will join along. But mm. if your intention is to kind of dump it and run, then I think people will also pick up on that as well and they won't want to be part of that. No, so a community garden has to be sustainable. And to do that, you need a range of different people. You need that, that person who wants to be the initiator, instigator. You've got those people who need to be the connectors. And then you've got those people that need to be there for the long term yeah. to make it work. I think the other thing that you need to be prepared for is that you're going to be exposed to a, a big range of personalities and, and different types of people that you wouldn't normally be exposed to, which can be a challenge, but it's also the beauty of it as well. So it's what you're signing up for, but it's challenging when you need to find common grounds with people that don't have the same background as you. It's the essence of people, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the value of a community garden? There aren't many spaces left that are accessible to everyone and free for people to experiment in. So I think that's valuable. Also, aren't very many spaces where you can participate without having to spend money. That's a good point. Yeah. So it's nice for a change. <laughs> the garden is built on permaculture principles. One of the 12 ethics of permaculture is there's no such thing as waste. How does your garden help with that? So we try and make use of everything. So I guess seeing that waste or actually importing waste from the cafe to make our compost. So that's an example. The other ways that it comes into play in the garden is we don't have any commercial waste removal there. So we need to consider everything that we bring into the garden and where it's going to go when it's finished its life there. It's kind of out of balance when other people bring their waste to the garden. So it hurts, especially when we have a consciousness about trying not to waste things and then we get other people's waste brought to us. You'll also see it in the design aesthetic of the built infrastructure of the garden because it's not a business and it doesn't have a great pool of assets to draw from. A lot of the stuff that we build ends up being made from the stuff that is there, whether it's dumped from other people or left over from another project. So anyone can relate to that aesthetic of a community garden that's cobbled together out of waste items. And I struggle with that aesthetic a little bit because I think there's so many great lessons from permaculture and sometimes it's hard to sell when the aesthetic is things made out of rubbish. So I think I push back sometimes on how far other people would like to push that principle. So I think that's just something that I can learn from other people is to let go of how it looks. Yeah, yeah. Artists are really good at using waste and making it aesthetically look, look good. But yeah, like you're right, that everyone comes with different values. It's what you're talking about before, about the communities, a different range of people and different personalities and expectations. And that's probably one of those things as well. Yeah, that's right. And we need those artistic people to come and put their flair on the reused creativity that other people are bringing. 
I think it also helps if things are working well and things are growing, then that is its own aesthetic. Like a successful living garden has its own aesthetic and feeling that helps sell those ideas. What's something good that's happened? There was something nice that we were able to contribute. Because we regularly process food waste and make compost, we were able to offer that service to Rising Tide, who ran the big blockade of the coal port last year. They fed all the 3,000 people that turned up to that protest, and we were able to collect all that food waste and bring it back to Wickham and compost it. Now we're growing herbs, and we should be able to contribute some fresh food to the kitchen for this year. So that's a nice example of community participation and reusing of waste. So you're going to contribute food to the kitchen. Which kitchen would that be? Last year, 3,000 people got together to protest the ongoing export of coal in Newcastle Harbour, and there are plans to do it again this year. This year, they're expecting 10,000 people to turn up. Big numbers. And as far as I know, I think they're also planning on feeding those 10,000 people again. So we'd like to make a contribution of some herbs Ah, to the kitchen that we'll be feeding protesters. Yeah, so there's a big cycle then of, you know, the food waste from last year has then created the compost, which you've created plants, and then you can go back to them and say, well, we've got these herbs to to add to the food for this year. Yeah, and I mean, it's just a a bigger example and a higher publicity example of, I guess, what happens every week, and that is that people get to bring their waste and they get to take something that has grown out of it, which is a great metaphor for, for life and personal development as well. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I've had a humbling experience in thinking that by participating in the community garden that I'm doing a good thing for the community and providing food for anyone that might want to come and pick it and eat it. And unfortunately, quite frequently, there will be people sleeping rough in and around the community garden. And it was interesting to observe my first reaction to that in a period where it's been raining all week. Someone had set up in our undercover area there. And my first reaction was kind of an anger towards this person who was getting in the way of my good deed of growing food for people. And I had to check myself and kind of weigh those values, like the value of someone having a place, even though it's outside, having a place that's under the shelter from the rain versus other people being able to come through and pick parsley. Like of all the problems that exist in society, they are, they do exist on a ladder of priorities. And homelessness is much higher than the good feels that come from people who have homes being able to come and pick some parsley or some tomatoes. So the community garden is important for all the reasons that we've been talking about, but there are other things going on as well. It's, it's, a, it's a big social justice question and statement, really. It is. That, as you said, the, the main thing is that you're there for the community, yeah. you're there for the environmental reasons yeah. and to help people live sustainably. But there's a huge social element that um, cannot be ignored. Yeah. And what I can say is that when I'm exposed to that, I don't know how to feel about that and I don't know what to do about that. And so it's a big challenge to me and it challenges my perception on these things. But I can also say that there are other people at the community garden that do know how to approach those things. Like we have people there that cook for disadvantaged people multiple days of the week, every week. And being exposed to that compassion has been a real gift for me and a real learning lesson for me. Because I come into that space thinking that I have something to offer and then kind of learning that there are just so many other other ways that people can help and other things that we can do and that I can do. Thank you so much, Adrian, for taking the time to share the information you've gained from your community garden. Thank you for having me on your podcast and thank you for your wonderful project that just seems to be just a big and bold exploration into all the different things that we can possibly do to make things better. It's appreciated. Thank you to Awesome Newcastle for their support. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Renewee Living Podcast. 
This podcast was recorded on Awabakal country. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters in the Newcastle and Lake Macquarie region of New South Wales. I hope you're feeling more confident about doing better for our people and planet by taking a start where you live approach to living sustainably. If this episode has spurred you into action, please feel free to follow and share it with your friends. It would mean the world to me. Head over to my website, renewyliving.com.au for the show notes and blog posts from this episode. And you can also sign up to my regular emails. I look forward to sharing more stories with you next time.